In this second video on uh, cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular pathology, I'm going to look at uh, some of the assessment techniques we use uh, for cardiovascular disease, including our history and specific assessment tools that are used clinically to estimate a person's, for example, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, and then we'll look at specific tests and, and imaging uh, techniques. So what are the biomedical assessment methods for cardiovascular disease? Um, they're really used to determine several different things. One is the structure and function uh, of the heart and uh, blood vessels. Uh, they also look at cardiovascular disease risk factors, how we can predict those. Uh, we look for any presence of cardiovascular red flags, and uh, I'll talk about those as we go through the different conditions. And uh, part of our assessment is going to be the need to determine whether or not a patient really should be referred. Uh, if you're not a primary care physician, then at least to primary care. Uh, and if you're primary care, maybe if you need to refer that to a specialist. Um, you know, one of our major tools, of course, is history. So we're going to get for cardiovascular disease a full history, including family history, of any known cardiovascular disease. Um, and then identify all of those important cardiovascular disease risk factors that we spoke about in the last uh, video, like smoking, tobacco smoking, lack of exercise, their diet, and so forth. Um, just a couple of specialties to know about. So cardiologist is, of course, a specialist in heart disease. Um, there, we can really divide cardiologists into two groups. they are physicians and surgeons. The physicians actually have several subspecialties. So there's you know, typical adult cardiology. There's uh, pediatric or children's cardiology. There's cardiac electrophysiology, and these are physicians trained specifically to work with the ECG, and they work a lot with cardiac arrhythmias. Um, some of them do more interventional methods where they actually do what's called cardiac ablation techniques. Uh, so it'd be a cardiac uh, electrophysiologist. Um, echocardiography uh, is where we use the, the ultrasound, but there are special training for that. Um, interventional cardiologists are the ones that primarily do the stent placements, so they'll go in with the catheters, they do angiograms, stents, that sort of thing. And then there's a subspecialty of nuclear cardiology. These are physicians trained to use all the nuclear imaging techniques, perfusion studies, and so forth. Um, then we have the cardi cardiologist surgeons, so we have cardiothoracic surgeons. They do the open heart surgeries, uh, things like what's called the coronary artery bypass graft, cabbage. So a PCI, uh, uh, remember, is uh, basically the PCI is the stent that's placed per cutaneous intervention. That's done through a catheter. There's no open heart or anything with that. But a cabbage is uh, a coronary artery bypass graft where they actually clip out a portion of the coronary artery that's become stenotic. And they've actually they put in often a piece of a vein from the leg uh, in that area uh, to allow more proper blood flow. Uh, so you might see in a patient's chart they've had a cabbage times four. What that means is they had an open heart procedure and they had four different grafts put in at different sites. Cabbage times two would be two different sites. Usually we don't, they don't do cabbages uh, for anything less than usually three or four blockages. They'll typically uh, will use the PCI for those procedures. As you can imagine, a cabbage is a major procedure. It's an open heart. The chest is cracked open. Uh, and person is put, essentially, the, the heart is stopped. They're put on a heart-lung bypass machine during the procedure. And then, um, you know, uh, the blood is restored to the heart. The heart starts back up again. But the healing time with this is uh, usually very long. We're talking weeks or months. Versus the PCI, it's often an outpatient procedure. And um, so the recovery time, there's just a small incision in the leg often uh, uh, that's made. Um, Okay, so that's the different specialties there. Um, in addition to history, our physical exam uh, is going to differ uh, biomedically depending on whether or not we have diseases of the vessels or of the heart. So in terms of the physical exam for the vessels, we have what's called the peripheral circulatory exam. And that exam looks for evidence of any poor circulation, um, cyanosis, anything like that, evidence of poor circulation to the skin. Um, it's going to look for palpation of the um, pulses in, for example, the ankles and the foot and so forth, uh, assess any coldness or lack of circulation into the feet or hands and so forth. So that's going to look for, for example, 
uh, periphery artery disease, any blockage of, of arterial blood flow to the legs. You're going to look also for edema and things like that, which might indicate blockage of the venous outflow uh, to the legs. Uh, going to assess for any carotid or peripheral bruies suggestive of atherosclerosis. Remember, a bruity, bruy is heard with a stethoscope. is a sloshing sound heard over an artery, uh, which would indicate a blockage. Uh, an abdominal exam checking the aortic artery. So we usually palpate through the abdominal wall, press all the way down through the intestines, and we can feel at the back of the abdominal wall the aorta. And um, normally um, we can sort of feel the rough edges of how wide it is. And if it's over a certain level, we that might be indicative of an aneurysm that would need to be investigated. Uh, very interesting test, which you know we could do a lot more in the clinic, but it's not used as much. It's called the ankle brachial pressure index. It's actually a very useful test in atherosclerosis. Uh, basically, we take blood pressures at the arm, like typical, uh, and at the ankle, and we compare them. And so the ABI is actually the systolic pressure at the ankle uh, over the systolic pressure at the, in the arm, at the brachial artery. And uh, typically, a normal ABI is gonna be around one, so 0.9 to 1.2. Uh, if it is less than that, uh, so if it's way over that, that would mean that essentially the vessels are very sclerotic and they're incompressible. Um, but usually when it's less than that, uh, we're going to start to see evidence, for example, 0.41 to 0.9 of mild to moderate peripheral artery disease and less than 0.41 severe peripheral artery diseases. So it can give us an idea, especially if we're, uh, we have claudication or anything like that, uh, that might... Uh, be helpful for diagnosing that. And then now increasingly there are handheld Dopplers that some physicians carry in their offices. These are ultrasound machines to check for blood flow uh, through uh, a blood vessel. There are different laboratory tests that are used for uh, vascular diseases. So looking for systemic inflammation, this would be doing the ESR or the CRP. Now I mentioned in the last video the high sensitivity CRP. That's different than this one. CRP is going to be elevated more with like real inflammation, like vasculitis and things like that. And then uh, a CBC to check for any anemia or infections. And then different imaging techniques for vascular diseases would be Doppler ultrasound, angiography, where we inject a contrast agent into a vessel and take an x-ray and look at the blood flow, and then an MRI or CT. Um, so that's for vessel diseases. The list is a lot longer for the heart. Here we do the cardiac physical exam. This is usually paired with the respiratory exam. Um, and uh, the cardiac exam essentially involves inspection, looking for any cyanosis, edema. Uh, is there an enlarged liver? We do that on uh, palpation. Um, we check the blood pressure at the brachial artery. Uh, we check for the radial pulse, looking at the rate and the rhythm, the volume and the shape. We check for any jugular venous distension, JVD, and that's where the uh, that occurs when the venous blood backs up in right heart failure uh, in the venous tree and your jugular vein actually uh, looks really distended in the neck. And uh, so we can look for that. Um, we can uh, palpate the point of maximal impulse at the fifth interspace of the heart. And we can see if it's shifted. For example, in left ventricular hypertrophy, we see that it shifts way towards the side of the chest. And uh, so that could be the first sign that we have an enlarged heart there. Uh, and then we're going to listen to the heart in, uh, we already went over this in the physiology section, but at the four different positions, um, listening with both the bell and the diaphragm of the stethoscope, listening for your heart sounds, listening for the normal S1, S2, and if there's a, maybe an S3 or S4 or any other murmurs, uh, rubs or what are called gallops. So we're going to look for all of those. Um, our blood tests with the heart would be things like a CBC complete metabolic panel, which of course checks your glucose, electrolytes, liver kidney function, proteins. Um, so basically again, CBC is checking for the blood elements in your plasma, your red cells, white cells, and platelets. A CMP is analyzing your plasma. What are all the different constituents in the plasma? Um, your, uh, another assessment tool is a cardiovascular risk assessment. And that's going to involve the lipid panel that I spoke about in the last video. And then maybe a hemoglobin A1C, which is going to be the estimate of your last three months of blood sugars. So that will tell us about insulin resistance and potential prediabetes or diabetes. Looking at thyroid uh, hormone is important, the TSH, um, especially for initial screening for patients. 
And then uh, other blood tests for assessing cardiovascular health would be things like the troponin test that I talked about in the cardiac physiology videos. If you have any myocardial injury, you'll spill troponins, specifically troponin I and troponin T into the blood, and these can be measured, and that's a sign of a heart attack. Um, creatine kinase and lact, uh, uh, lactate dehydrogenase are other enzymes that can be found in the blood that would indicate myocardial uh, tissue damage. And then another important biomarker, which we'll talk about with heart failure, is uh, BNP, brain natriuretic peptide. I mentioned this in the cardiac physio videos that your ventricles also secrete this. And when the ventricle, ventricles become enlarged, they hypersecrete BNP. And so that can tell us that your ventricles are enlarging and the heart is failing. And then different inflammatory markers are sometimes measured. And again, I'll talk about when they might be appropriate, like the LP little a and HSCRP that I talked about earlier. Um, other tests would be, in addition to monitoring blood pressure in a doctor's office, would be what's called ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And that's where the patient is fitted with an automatic device that measures the blood pressure throughout the day. And we have data that actually that's more accurate than just getting your blood pressure taken uh, either by yourself at home uh, or by at the doctor's office. So uh, sometimes we go further and fit patients for an ambulatory BP device. We can use our electrocardiogram, which we briefly touched upon in the physio videos. Uh, and we can do that at rest with the patient resting or while they're on the treadmill. And that's called an exercise stress test. And we can see how their heart functions and how the electrical rhythm of the heart functions under demand. And then we have different imaging tests that we can do for cardiovascular disease, a very common one to see if the heart is enlarged is a chest x-ray. Um, and I'll show you pictures of what an enlarged heart looks like on that. Um, echocardiogram is the ultrasound, and that can be done through the chest wall or through the esophagus. A very important test for uh, measuring cardiac output as well as valve function, etc. cetera. Uh, nuclear imaging would do, be perfusion studies looking at the uh, perfusion of the heart and how the blood is flowing with radioactive tracers. And then uh, cardiac MRI is kind of an emerging technology. Uh, we have a coronary CT angiography. That's actually going to be used to assess the amount of calcification in your coronary arteries uh, as a predictive tool for atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease. And that's going to be part of the uh, what's called the coronary artery and calcium score. And then there's cardiac catheterization, uh, and that involves actually putting catheters in to assess the pressure within the different chambers of the heart. That's done more in advanced settings, hospital, etc. And then uh, I already talked about coronary artery angiography uh, to kind of visualize the blood flow through the coronary arteries. So it's a lot of tests, but this is just a complete list of all the, the tests that are used in cardiology um, and uh, even in primary care practices to uh, work up different cardiovascular conditions. Okay, so in addition to history and physical exam, what are some of the other assessment tools that are used biomedically to uh, estimate uh, cardiovascular disease and especially atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk? Um, this would be our different primary prevention tools like the ASCBD risk calculator. So I wanna talk a little bit about this because this is very commonly used now in primary care cardiology settings for estimating ASCBD risk. Um, so these guidelines come from the American Heart Association and the American College of, uh, College of Cardiology. They were put out in 2013 and they had an update in 2017. Uh, but basically what this calculator is, you can download this uh, for free online. There's websites that have it. There's also different apps that uh, allow you to calculate it on your phone. This determines a person's 10-year uh, risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, and it's most accurate because they pool data from this particular age group. It's most accurate in those between 40 and 70 years of age. That's not to say it doesn't have some applicability in younger patients, but usually we use it in patients uh, between 40 and 70. Um, and it's used for patients with no history of cardiovascular disease. So this is for primary prevention. Remember that is uh, prevention in a person without any known uh, cardiovascular disease uh, or no history of it. Um, it helps to predict and uh, predict the risk and uh, make recommendations for, and management strategies for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, and it basically gives you a percentage. 
So patients who have a less than 5% uh, risk from the ASCBD 10-year calculator, um, if it's less than 5%, they have low risk for ASCBD. Borderline risk is defined as 5 to 7.5% intermediate 7.5 to 20% and high risk is over 20%. Uh, and various factors are used in the equation. So age, history of diabetes, uh, person's sex, uh, whether or not they're a tobacco smoker, their total cholesterol, their HDL cholesterol. Notice that the LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol is not on that equation. Their systolic blood pressure and uh, whether or not they're on any treatment for high blood pressure. Now, based on the ASCVD risk, this is where the recommendations for cholesterol lowering and so forth come in. So we can use this number to help us predict how aggressive treatment needs to be uh, at, uh, aimed at preventing different cardiovascular disease risk factors. So specifically looking at the cholesterol in the lipid panel, remember a lipid panel contains the uh, total cholesterol LDL cholesterol, HDL triglycerides. Uh, I'm gonna talk here about kind of what the um, uh, recommendations are for when we should screen, and then later I'll talk about what the numbers should be. Uh, for example, which risk categories need uh, higher levels of lipid therapy and so forth. So I'm not gonna talk about those numbers yet, but in terms of who needs these screening tests, so these would all be part of assessing our ASCVD risk. Um, our lipid panels are typically done non-fasting, um, they used to recommend lipid panels to be done fasting only. Uh, now we only do them fasting if the triglycerides are over 400 uh, or uh, there's maybe some other need to do them fasting. But usually we, we say these should be non-fasting. And a fast, again, is an 8 to 10 hour overnight fast. So they can be done any time of day, non-fasting. So basically under 40, who needs a lipid panel? We actually don't typically do routine testing unless the patient has major uh, CVD risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, a positive family history of cardiovascular disease and smoking. Um, between age 40 and 75, we do a non-fasting lipid panel about every five years. And then over 75, we usually don't do any more screening uh, unless there are other ASCVD risk factors. So that's a little guideline on who should get a lipid panel uh, and when. Um, and then um, we rescreen based on different ASCVD risk factors. So if the ASCVD risk, CVD risk is less than 7.5% over 10 years, we screen generally just every five years. Um, and then uh, if the risk is intermediate, 7.5 to 15%, then we screen every two years. Annually, if the risk is over 15% uh, and they're not on any cholesterol lowering medication. So that's just uh, some of the guidelines there for you. Now, what about some of those other biomarker tests like the HSCRP? So this is where the ASCVD risk can be helpful because it tells us when the CRP actually can give us useful information. And that's gonna be in those with uh, a uh, ASCVD risk between 7.5 and 20%. So the intermediate risk category. Um, and this helps to decide if statin therapy really is needed. So if the, if the uh, CRP is less than one milligram per liter, um, the risk is actually going to be lower in that patient than what the ASCVD risk calculator gives us. Uh, if the levels are 1 to 3 milligrams per liter, the risk is going to be close to the ASCVD risk calculation. If it's greater, three point, uh, so going up to 3.1, up to 10 milligrams per liter, um, the risk is going to be higher than what the calculator is giving us. And usually if it's over 10, that means there's probably inflammation somewhere else in the body like that, an injury or they have a cold or something like that. Uh, and we should reassess it when the uh, injury is gone, when that inflammation level has calmed down. So this is where in the intermediate risk, ASCVD risk category, HSCRP can be helpful for guiding our therapy, letting us know if the calculator is really giving us a good risk or if it needs to be modified. Now, the use of other biomarkers is controversial. Um, Basically, the explanation a lot of people give is that um, although these are correlated with, with ASCVD risk, uh, they have a minimal prognostic value when uh, we are already measuring those other conventional markers. But things like the LP little a, uh, phospholipase A2, apoprotein B, and ankyobrachial index less than 0.9 could all be indicators of uh, greater atherosclerotic risk. 
There is some uh, role for these for intermediate risk categories for patients. So the American Heart Association and American Cardio Cardiology says actually they're helpful to measure. Uh, organizations like Kaiser actually don't like these at all. And, um, and this is uh, good to know for functional medicine, integrated practitioners. Sometimes uh, what happens is um, those practitioners will want these tests from a patient because they know that having more of these risk factors increases your risk. So they'll send them to the doctor at Kaiser. The Kaiser will say, no, we're not doing these tests. And this is the rationale they give is that, well, with the lipid panel, your ASCVD risk calculator and your HSCRP, that's usually enough to know how we can stratify our patients. One additional test that's out there that's being used, again, for intermediate risk patients uh, is the coronary artery calcium scoring, CAC score. And that is where the uh, patient's given a CT scan of their coronary arteries and they get a score uh, depending on how much calcification is there. And that's gonna correlate with the level of uh, placking they have in those coronary arteries. So if we see a patient with a very high score uh, and they base the scores on the age, the sex, and the age of the patients and kind of what the normal ranges are. If you're much higher than normal, then that's going to indicate that your risk is probably a lot higher than what your ASCBD risk is calculating for you. So that could be another helpful tool to help uh, stratify risk. So this is kind of the thinking that's it's important to know about that's used in primary care and cardiology circles for stratifying people's risks and uh, the different kinds of screening exams we can use to help us with that. Now, another very important tool for cardiovascular disease assessment uh, is the electrocardiogram. And uh, it can be performed in several different ways. So there, there's the resting ECG. Remember in German, it's EKG. In uh, English, it's ECG, electrocardiogram. Um, so the resting ECG uh, is just done at rest, patient is lying down, uh, and those electrodes uh, are taped to the chest. And uh, remember, we usually use the 12 lead ECG. Um, it's actually not 12 leads, but we get 12 leads based on the placement of the leads. So we have six of the chest leads, and then to form the uh, Einthoven's triangle, we have three additional leads that we use. So technically nine leads are placed on the body, but we get 12 different measurements and that's gonna graph out on the paper like I explained in the previous videos. Uh, stress ECG, uh, also known as the cardiac stress test, is when a person has all the leads taped to their body and now the readings are taken when the person's on the treadmill. Um, and uh, so that lets us see how the heart performs under stress. Uh, Hulter monitor refers to uh, a device where um, we get a 24 to 48 hour uh, ECG reading. So if for different arrhythmias that kind of come up randomly, periodically during the day, you're not at your doctor's office, this is a helpful device to capture those. There's also something called a cardiac event monitor. You can wear that for a month and then every time you feel an abnormal heart rhythm, you press a little button and it starts to record the ECG tracing. And this is gonna allow the doctors to figure out what kind of arrhythmia you actually have and, um, and so forth. Um, and then there's implantable ECGs as well. Um, most of the ECGs are 12 lead devices, but we can also, as I explained in the previous videos, use a single lead ECG, like on your iPhone, to just give you a sense of whether or not uh, you're having a certain type of arrhythmia, like atrial fibrillation. Uh, remember, ECG measures your heart rate, your heart rhythm, the axis of the heart, whether or not there's any ventricular hypertrophy, and then the presence of any ischemia or infarction in the heart. So all that can be obtained from the 12 lead ECG. A single lead ECG could just give you pretty much the first two. And um, so you don't get all the other information. So again, resting 12 lead ECG would be one example there. And then the stress would be on the treadmill. Now, um, there are other ways some people can't do the treadmill test, but we need to know how their heart performs under stress. So that's, uh, we can use what's called pharmacologic stress testing. And uh, this stresses the heart with different pharmacologic agents. And uh, so adenosine is one of them. It's a coronary vasodilator. Um, the um, uh, other test here, I'm not gonna speak at length about, but they're all different ways of giving pharmacologic agents to essentially assess the um, function of the heart. So that's the electrocardiogram. And we'll um, look at how the ECG tracings change with different arrhythmias in the arrhythmia section. Another extremely important heart muscle imaging technique is echocardiography. Um, it's non-invasive, uses ultrasound. 
one of the most widely used tests actually in cardiology in addition to the EKG. Um, there are different types, uh, what are called 2D, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and Doppler ultrasound, uh, and it produces different images of the heart. Um, there are especially trained physicians and technicians that do this. Usually a technician will do the actual uh, uh, test and then uh, physicians will look at the data and interpret that. Um, the echocardiogram, sometimes abbreviated as an echo, so cardiac echo, same thing, um, gives us an outline of the heart, shows the four chambers, it's able to visualize the valves, and it can look at the speed of uh, blood flow and pressure of blood within the heart. Uh, and it can give specific estimates of your cardiac output, your ejection fraction with each heartbeat, how much blood is ejected. Uh, remember, a normal ejection fraction is about 55 to 70 percent or so. And then your diastolic function is the ventricle, or, or the ventricles able to relax fully in diastole. So very useful in the diagnosis and management of cardiomyopathies, heart valve issues, and heart failure. Uh, this can be combined with the stress test, and that's called stress echocardiography. So we, what we do there is we uh, do an echocardiogram when the patient, before they get on the treadmill, check their heart. Have them get on the treadmill, usually do that with the 12 lead ECG, the stress test. Then they get off the treadmill, and then we do another echocardiogram immediately after. And uh, we can look for any abnormalities in the wall motion of the heart. Um, so there's all sorts of really amazing technology now. With, that gives very clear images of the heart in the different chambers using the echocardiography. There's different types of echocardiography. So the most common is transthoracic through the thoracic wall uh, in the chest. Um, the other is through the esophagus, transesophageal. Uh, again, we can do the stress echocardiography. Um, you can actually, there are catheters that can be placed inside the chambers of the heart and gives us an intracardiac echocardiography. There's intravascular ultrasound, so we can use that more to assess your blood vessels and their function. And then there's what's called 4D echo, and that is taking 3D images in time, um, and that captures moving pictures of the heart. And then different contrast agents can be used as well, giving us contrast echocardiography. So lots of different forms of that. Uh, another important imaging test, although less commonly performed, would be the nuclear stress test. And uh, this gives us uh, a, the uh, picture of how well the myocardium is being perfused with blood flow. And uh, usually it uses uh, thallium or uh, technetium-99, sestamibi as a contrast agent, and that's injected intravenously uh, during the test. And then the scans uh, with a gamma camera capture images of the blood flow obtained before and after the exercise. And these are short-lived isotopes, so they uh, undergo their half-life very quickly. So that's a nuclear stress test. And then we have the cardiac MRI, and this takes MRI pictures of the heart structure. Uh, this is not as widely used, a lot more expensive, but um, I've seen some literature emerging that this is really a very useful test, especially for cardiomyopathies and whatnot. Uh, the cardiac MRI can be synchronized with the ECG, uh, so we can see exactly where in the heart uh, cardiac cycle the different pictures are being taken, and that can be very helpful for looking at any chamber abnormalities and so forth. So those are three very common imaging tests of the heart, the echocardiogram, nuclear stress test, cardiac MRI. Of those three, the echo is the by far the most widely used. I already talked about uh, coronary angiography in a previous video. Um, again, just quickly to summarize, it can be used both diagnostically and for treatment. Um, and uh, basically it allows us to get a picture of the coronary arteries for any occlusion, stenosis or restenosis, any, so if, if stents were placed and they got uh, stenotic again. So it's not uncommon for those areas, either in a cabbage, uh, the coronary artery bypass graft where they put the graft in place or they put the stent in years later that can become replaqued and restenosed. And so that could, uh, uh, the angiography would pick that up any presence of any thrombosis and then any aneurysms. Um, and so this would uh, be again uh, injecting the contrast agent um, and this is using very low dose x-rays uh, to uh, take pictures of the blood vessels. And then the therapeutic procedure as I said before is the percutaneous coronary intervention PCI where the stent is placed. Uh, and the stent could be drug-eluting, and the drug prevents uh, inflammation and fibrosis around the stent. Uh, 
uh, and it delays the, the time it takes for it to potentially become restenosed. Uh, but patients after this procedure will have to be on an antiplatelet medication. Uh, remember the clopidogrel or Plavix is one example of that. They may need to be on an anticoagulant as well, depending on the severity of their risk factors. Two other tests I'll mention that you hear a fair amount uh, about in the more functional medicine circles is coronary artery imaging, and that uh, would be coronary calcium scan. Um, so as I mentioned, this is for uh, pa patients with intermediate ASCVD risk, can help us give us a little bit more of an estimate of how severe uh, any placking might be in their coronary arteries and how aggressive we need to be with therapy. But the, this uses a CT scan uh, to look for the presence of calcifications in the coronary arteries. So you can see that in the picture here, that white area is calcification. And um, we patients will get what's called a Agatston score or a coronary artery calcium, CAC score. And uh, this CAC score is really an independent marker of risk for cardiac events, cardiac mortality, and all-cause mortality. Um, and it provides us, again, additional prognostic information. Um, usually we do this with a radio contrast agent, but it can be done without one as well. Um, I have sent many, several patients for this. Uh, OHSU is offering for, I think, out-of-pocket $75. I think it's a little bit more uh, as of uh, 2019, 2020. Um, uh, for this test. And, um, you know, it, again, it can be helpful. I've had some patients where their physician was really recommending the statin medication because they were at intermediate risk and uh, the patient didn't want to. We did the coronary artery calcium score and they had zero plaque. And uh, so we could safely say they really didn't need the medication. Another patient was intermediate risk. We did the test and they were at very high risk. They had a lot of calcification indicating high plaque risk. And uh, so in that case, we went ahead and, and made that recommendation. So it can be helpful uh, to um, differentiate those patients. Another test, which is not conventionally really used much, but it's used again, kind of in more functional circles, is to actually use ultrasound, so non-invasive, no x-rays, to look at the carotid artery in the neck to see how thick the intima is. And that can be uh, uh, an estimate of placking there as well. And the um, idea is that if there's more plaque in the carotid artery, that indicates plaque all around the body and that your risk for cardiovascular disease will be higher. Um, we don't really have a clear way to uh, integrate this with the ASCVD risk data currently, so it's not really recommended, but you still see at some of the health fairs and whatnot, people are recommending the carotid artery uh, intima media thickness, IMT, ultrasound test and uh, just know what that is and that it can be potentially another useful factor in addition to the risk factors for estimating uh, one's cardiovascular risk. Okay, so that's a summary for the assessment of cardiovascular disorders. In the next little video, I'll just summarize the basic treatments and then we'll dive into individual conditions.